So last up is Professor of Sociology James Kitts. James received his PhD from Cornell and has previously held faculty positions at Columbia, Dartmouth College, and University of Washington. Came to UMass in 2012 to co-found the Computational Social Science Institute, uh, bridging computational social science, sociology, and public health. <clears throat> James has monitored networks of social interaction among graduate students using wearable sensors modeled networks of patient transfers among hospitals, and now heads a six-year study on health behavior on social networks of none other than middle school students, which he was just telling me about, which is quite a challenge. So please welcome James Kitts. Why are there tables in school cafeterias? James. Okay, first of all, there's a, I forgot to give you a trigger warning. Uh, anyone who might have flashbacks from middle school I might, might, might need to exit, exit now. Uh, I'm going to just give you a, a few minutes uh, taster of a, of a big research project I'm working on. I just came back from, from uh, middle schools in Springfield, so I'm a little hoarse from, that, from uh, running surveys with a, a lot of middle school students. Um, I, the, the study was motivated by a really hot question in public health right now, which is, is obesity contagious? Which is a, a special case of, of the question, are, are health outcomes and health behaviors, do they travel through networks like, like viruses? Do they travel through social networks like viruses? And we're going to break that down into a more basic question, which, which is why are there tables in school cafeterias? And it, that may seem like a, a weird and abstract question, but if you were to actually go in like, like I am and sit down and watch the kids in a cafeteria interact, you'll see something like these, these are just rent pictures that I just randomly grabbed off of, of, of Google Images, and you'll see pictures like this, where, uh, in, in fact, almost every conversation you see occurring in the, co in, the, in the cafeteria is between the two people who are most similar to one another in the entire cafeteria, and the tables seem to have themes, and, and in, a, in, a, in a diverse school like these pictures, you'll find the tables are, are very starkly divided by gender, by race, by age, by, by ethnicity, language, and so on. We also see they're divided by, by the type of shirt collar, by favorite band, uh, by, by, uh, by hairdo, and so on. In fact, when I look at this picture, I, I imagine the, the, most, the most miserable person in the picture is this, this girl here with the red, red shirt on because she has blonde hair and so she feels that she should, she should sit at the blonde table and yet she has a ponytail. And so she should be sitting at the ponytail table over there. And she, can't, she seems like waffling between the two tables. Otherwise, everyone else seems to be pretty happy, surrounded by people identical to themselves. So this actually occurs even in a, in a less diverse school. If you go to a school that, for example, is all white students, you would still find uh, you'd have the table of the hippies. Uh, you think of think of your own school, uh, you, the table table of the of the jocks, a table of, of these these people. Um, <laughs> these were people in black pibs in, in my in my school. I don't know what they were called in yours. And then the the, the table that, that some some <laughs> professors sat at themselves. And, and what we're doing in the study is trying to investigate what are the overarching social forces that bring about this pattern of cliquishness in, in schools or actually in human societies in general, the very pervasive tendency for people to operate in cliques. And, and so one, one mechanism is, is uh, maybe these, these people were, were friends and they influenced each other to like Star Trek. Another is maybe they liked Star Trek already and they became friends because they had something in common. Another is that, that uh, they maybe they joined the Star Trek club because they like Star Trek and they made friends in the club and, that, and that, that led to the same pattern. Another is friends of friends become friends and that tends to amplify and consolidate these same patterns and generate this, the more of these self-similar self -similar cliques. And then lastly, maybe that no one wants to hang out with the Star Trek kids and they end up hanging out with each other by, by default and that, uh, all, of these, all of these forces will generate, generate that, same, that same pattern. And so in this study, we're, we, it's a six-year study of, of middle, schools, middle schools in Springfield, and we're actually trying to adjudicate these various forces. And, and a motivation here is, is if you're trying to design a public health intervention to promote healthy behaviors, and you're doing so in the context of a, of a social world that is profoundly for, formed into, into separate cliques like this, and maybe the cliques don't even get along with one another, it can really affect the, the effectiveness of your intervention. And, and there's a lot of people out there trying to design interventions that take advantage of social networks that are, are unfortunately uh, ignorant to the way the social networks are actually structured in these schools. So we're trying to, in a, in a period of six years, uh, understand these forces and, and, and uh, to, to do that, one, one, we're following four cohorts of students in four diverse Springfield middle schools uh, for three years. 
Uh, next, we're tracking their health behavior and their health outcomes, uh, particularly their, their screen time, their, their physical activity, and their diet. And then we're also tracking their networks, who they like and dislike, who they spend time with in a variety of different ways, and who they call their friend. And so we're analyzing the way these behaviors and, and the networks and the health outcomes interoperate or co-evolve over time. And our, our interest is in, in one, we're, we're using a set of statistical and computational models to help us understand what are the basic dynamics here so that we can have a better understanding for social scientists in general, but also to, to bring it back to the public health community. In the context, if this is the way the social networks are organized, how do we design better public health interventions that are, that are aware of the way these, these networks are organized? Thank you.